Hey guys, I just want to bring up an opportunity for resource investors. If you want to rub elbows with the big wigs and talk to companies directly that are handpicked by Rick Rule, well, you got to be in Boca Raton from July 7th to 11th for the Rick Rule Symposium. The event has become a premier event in the mining space, and they're going to have some pretty big speakers like Robert Friedland, Sean Rusin, and the great Rick Rule. And also, we're going to be there. You can meet the Deep Dive team in person. So if you're interested in rubbing elbow with some of the biggest heavy hitters in junior mining, check out the link below. Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm chatting with Jonathan Deleuze from Abitibi Metals. Guys, if you are unaware, the price of copper has been on fire lately, running from just under $4 to right around $5 at the time of filming. And if you are unfamiliar with Abitibi Metals, they recently announced some pretty huge copper drill holes at their B26 property in Quebec. So we figured it'd be a great time to have Jonathan on to talk about the recent drill results and his read on the copper market. I've known Jonathan for a few years now, and I have to say he is unbelievably knowledgeable about the Canadian junior markets, especially in regards to mining. So guys, I think that this is a good interview to watch if you are looking and trying to do your homework on various copper junior deals, because Avatibi has hit some pretty big holes. And I think that Jonathan has the backing to take this deal all the way. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Jonathan, so thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So let's start off talking about what's been happening with copper. There's a lot of talk now on social media and uh, some of the big financial uh, media companies that we are in the early stages of a bit of a, I guess we could say a copper short squeeze. Uh, the price of copper sitting around $5. It feels like that, like, it, it 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 escalated really quickly. We we're it's not that long ago we were under four dollars and now we're just hovering around five. What's your take on what's happening in the gold market? Do you think that this can continue to uh, go higher? Uh, you think we can consolidate here? What's your just general take on it? Well, it's I think it's it's been a lot of we've been hearing about the supply demand imbalance in the copper market for a while. I think we're starting to see different factors collide uh, that is now causing the price reaction. We're seeing uh, we're seeing also political uh, political items like the the large mine that first quantum had taken offline in Panama that removed a material forward supply of, of, of copper going into the future. And I think that brings up the risk and 50% of the copper supply worldwide is from areas of political instability. So I think the Panama uh, example, I think, is part of the equation where people are also worried about where supply is going to be coming from. Are they secure supply in already a very tilted supply in demand imbalance that is just starting to hit the, 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 uh, the shortage this year, but will accelerate significantly through to 2030? So I think that the first quantum example is really important for junior mining investors. And um, when I think about it, I think about if if you're thinking about buying a risk stock, let's say a junior mining company that is trading at you know a $15 million market cap, and you're saying, I think that they have a shot of one day having a mine. And then you think about they do everything right along the way. And then for whatever reason, all that capital has been spent, all that time, all those resources have gone in to getting them to the finish line. And then the community is like, yeah, we don't really want you guys to move forward with this. I think that it really puts a uh, bit of a red flag and it. it's some, some serious head headwinds in the junior mining space when we look at people who do want to deploy that risk capital and it makes me wonder if that means that the prices of commodities have to go way higher so that there's more money involved, so that there's more money to just grease the overall engine. What are your thoughts on, on the overall lack of uh, development that we've seen in the mining world and, and, and how big of a problem is this? Well, I think it's a massive problem. It starts at the majors and the severe lack of exploration investment because they're not even getting valued on the current move in both commodities like copper, but also on the gold side. They're trading like if gold was still at fifteen hundred dollars per ounce in the level of cash flow and and performance that they're seeing at twenty four hundred dollar gold. But I think as well to to your earlier point is 
is exploration is already a very risky business without political risk. So I think over this cycle where we see copper and gold becoming, I think, much more of a strategic asset and it being important for for backing fiat currency or having stockpiling it onto a government balance sheet to combat what has been going, the impact of monetary debasement. So I think the importance of investing in tier one jurisdictions will continue to have more importance because as you said, investing in these companies without political risks is already risky, but to find a world-class discovery and then have it taken away by a political interference is severely hurtful for our space because it's there's already so little capital in our space you don't want to then benefit and have all these investors counting their their winnings and then have the rug pulled from them so i would rather have be in a tier one jurisdiction that may not be as underexplored as the riskier jurisdictions but i know if i find something that we have as low a risk as possible for for having any political interference that could interfere with our investors realizing the value that we've created. So that being said, I know that you are a pretty hardworking guy. You've been in junior mining for years now, um, uh, and you've sort of seen some cycles, I guess we could say. Um, we're hearing that the likes of Stanley Drunken Miller and uh, Michael Berry are now starting to play some big bets on commodities companies. I bringing this back to, um, to to your experience, I imagine that you are talking to institutional investors and some high net worth individuals and hedge funds that are kicking tires and they're doing their homework. How has the conversation changed over the last, say, six months versus the previous uh, five years? Well, I think a, a sign of things getting better is the fact that we have had a lot of interest from Australian institutions. The Australian junior mar mining market is much healthier than ours. They have much better valuations and they're sitting on a lot of capital that they've extracted out of the lithium trade. But overall, they've seen their markets become a lot healthier than the Canadian markets. But now that now they're seeing their market being maybe closer to being fairly valued, but they realize the Canadian markets are undervalued. It hasn't participated in the move and they're deploying capital in Canada. So it, I think it's a sign that that other markets are starting to realize how undervalued the Canadian markets are. And we're still early on in the move because commodity prices have moved, the precious metal prices have moved very well and broken out, but you can't tell that yet in the equities. But I think we're still early. I think it's also discouraging some investors from stepping into the market because they would have they would have expected that these stocks would have already moved but i do think the smarter money like as you said or that are positioning in commodities similar to my experience with the institutions in australia that are realizing the value gap that is present today that i think better times are coming but i think a lot of investors have been are impatient because it should have already moved which i agree but I think as we start to increase this breakout, I think investors will jump on once everybody starts talking about it, which I think is still quite under the radar. Okay, so we're talking about capital flowing into junior miners. That's a good time to segue into Abitibi Metals. It's the first time we've had you on the show. You and I have you you and I have known each other for years, but it's the first time I've 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 had the pleasure of having you on here. So um, high level, what's the story of Abitibi? So the story to condense what has been, I think, a company changing six months is we identified in these tough market conditions, we basically wound down our burn within the company, is self-funded the company as a family office to look for what we believed was a company making an acquisition that was only available in a tough marketplace. We landed on what I believe is was the best opportunity, which is the B26 deposit. And which is an opportunity that I'll probably not, never have again in my career. We picked up an optioned an asset of with a resource of 11.4 million tons at 3% copper equivalent that had never been in a public company. This was developed by Soquam, which is a subsidiary financed by the Quebec government. So this is a very unique opportunity that we were able to option an asset that hasn't been recycled through the different market cycles and we're on the fourth public company 
saying, what are we going to do next? We've built a strong partnership with a very systematic operator that has developed a very serious polymetallic asset in what I think is the best mining jur jurisdiction in Canada, Quebec. So, so we announced that in November. Since then, to summarize a long story short, we've raised $22 million with no warrants, internal financing without involving any of the investment banks to really position the company fully financed to the beginning of 2026, where we're really in a position of strength and still a soft overall market. So we drilled 13,500 meters at B26 in Q1. We're financed to complete 50,000 meters across 2024 and 2025. So it very, so I think we're uniquely positioned also with the move in commodity prices. Our resource in 2018 was done at $1,200 gold and 5,500 per ton copper. So half of what the price, the commodity and precious metal prices are trading at today. So I think we've really. I think in short order, we've gone from a small junior to one of the most active in the province of Quebec. And we have a lot of catalysts that are now fully funded for, for our following as we continue. And I think we'll benefit from a better market uh, that's just starting. So I have to ask, the B26 property has substantial historical exploration work on it, uh, over 115,000 meters of drilling. How did you manage to secure the property? So we were operating with our Besh for Gold project seven kilometers to the northeast. So we were in the camp, we were aware of the asset, but I think it took the right conditions to be able to show our value proposition as a small junior to Soquam in order to build this partnership. But I think it came down to us having a good track record in the camp, being able to operate extremely cost efficiently compared to our competitors, drilling at about 240 all in per meter. Uh, at a fraction of the cost of some of our, our neighbors in the camp, but also my family's track record of building strong partnerships in the province of Quebec, not only in mining, but in the airline business and real estate business, which is really what I think our partners wanted to see. They wanted to see, they didn't want to see a lifestyle company. They wanted to see a group that had the contacts to assemble a world-class team, which I believe we have, but also that were partnered and well-positioned alongside the the government essentially subsidiary that we would ensure the medium to long term prospects of developing this project. So I think we we went to them well backed a pathway to a a, a strong re rating in our in our stock and 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 have delivered on our financing milestones. We financed a seven year option in basically five months to complete it in two years, and really now we're in a strong. Uh, a, a strong position to catch up on the hiring and backfilling of what we need to do to really build this deposit to what we think will will be multiples of what it is today. So talking about the B26, what sort of size do you think a project like this needs to be proven out to be in order to say, hey, this this is officially a mine, we can definitively say we have something that makes economic sense? So I think like as of today, I mentioned 11. 4 million tons, but in the sensitivity test from the 2018 resource, if you were to drop the cutoff by 20%, it was printing roughly 15 million tons. So with the move in commodity prices, I think that's reasonable to speculate on. But I think you look at the the, the Salbe mine that's seven kilometers away that produced 53 million tons over 20 years. It went into production at around 20 million tons in an open pit that ramped into underground. And through continued exploration, while in production, they grew the resource another 150%. So I think if we're 11.4 today, you could speculate, could 50 million tons be representative based on the move in commodity prices? Time will tell, and some of our assessments will tell that. But we're, we're not far off of where the cell bay went into production at 20 million tons. Now, CapEx has gone up since there, but it's not like we're, we're a long ways away. And I believe we're funded to hit that milestone. And, and, and really, as we start to our phase two drill program, our goal is to provide a much better growth profile and where we see building that 10 to 20 million tons that really turns us into a world-class opportunity. So you guys are going to be drilling on B26 all summer, I take it. Um, uh, are you going to be drilling out uh, any of the other projects this summer? 
So Beshefer, which is seven kilometers away, we just completed 2,400 meters. We'll be doing another at least 1,500 to 2,000 meters. And that's a meaningful project as part of the B26 equation because could a PEA down the road include both deposits? We think it could to realize the synergies of a high-grade gold deposit complemented with a high-grade polymetallic. So I think they're both important together. But I think also at B26, we just announced and we've commenced a density survey that covering the entire property because these VMS systems occur in pods. You already see four VMS targets on this contact. So we're this is the first time a gravity survey, survey has been done property-wide to get an understanding of if there's an other parallel lenses, is there standalone B26 targets between the South Bay mine and B26, which we do cover a five kilometer extension of. So I think, as you mentioned, drilling the B26 deposit at depth, but also trying to make a standalone discovery on the property to test if there is another potential B26 within the land package as a whole. And I can see um, the 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 Beshefer, uh property. It's got some pretty big uh, intercepts over the years, almost five grams per ton gold over uh, nearly 28.9 meters, 4.92 grams per ton over 28.65 meters. That's, that's a pretty substantial uh, drill hole to be starting out with. Yeah, exactly. So we do expect and we'll have results out next month from Beshefer as well. We've taken risks here drilling, taking larger step outs, given that the market is focused on B26. But if we do have good results at Bash for next month, I think they'll be more meaningful. Something we have to ask just because uh, this is a question that's very important in the Canadian junior mining space, where, as I'm sure you're well aware, many of these companies are just cheap paper deals designed uh, to um, get the deal guys rich at the expense of the retail investors. Um, what can you tell us about the cap table of Abitibi? Uh, are there any significant investors? What's uh, the price that's been paid by uh, most of the shareholders? Uh, how if, if I am a retail investor and I'm looking at this story and saying, I think this is interesting, I, I see a lot of upside here, how can I have comfort that the share structure is structured in such a way that I can actually make money on my investment? So I think, so we have 110 million shares outstanding. Uh, no warrants. We were able to complete $22 million of financing without a warrant, which is rare, very rare in this market. So you don't have the overhang on the stock that could limit price discovery on potential development. So in terms of our cap structure as a whole, our first financing after B26 was done at 30 cents hard money, uh, hard in December. Our latest round in, in, in April was done at 42 cents hard plus uh, plus uh, a charity flow through component of that. And during that time, we've turned over, we've turned over our float uh, between November and now. So really, I think our, the cost base across the stock is, is in the range that we're trading at today. In terms of, I guess, myself and my family office, we've put in a, a, about $3 million of our own capital into the company. It, it was done at quite a bit lower prices, but I do think that that's also the result. We did finance in pretty much every round, including the last round that we just completed at 42 cents. But there's also got to be a reward for us being the only financers for a two-year period of time, keeping the lights on for the company as we position for an acquisition of this magnitude. So overall, I think we're very well structured. Uh, we've turned over our float, and I think we have now a cost base in this trading range. And myself and management, we have 20% of the of the float filed on SETI. So your followers can see exactly what we're doing with our position. Right, well, John, last question for you. Um, if I'm an investor watching or um, I'm a potential investor watching and I want to follow the story this summer, what am I looking for in terms of time timelines, milestones, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so we're we're taking a break, about a month break from drilling. But we will have likely weekly drill results up until the point that we restart drilling. So lots of news flow. We have the results of the gravity survey, which I think could be material if we are able to identify a strong target. Using the survey over the B26, getting that signature and looking up trend to see if we have any similar targets that we can drill this summer. So I think 
drilling. I think we are considering bringing an, uh, out an updated resource to capture cu current commodity prices. We're still trying to determine if we're able to do that at this point or if we'll have to wait for this drill program being completed to then include those holes as part of that update. So I think that's also potential. Um, I think there's there's some other other we have a grassroots portfolio that we have some partners that are working on that we've optioned out of the company, which we could have some news flow from. Uh, but really, I think it's B26 focused. We're going to have some results out from Beshifer. But I think the biggest thing is we've removed the financial risk out of earning 80 percent of Beshifer. And we've removed the financial risk out of being able to deliver on our exploration plans and supporting all of our GNA up until the beginning of 2026. So really, unless we're in a position of strength to take on more capital to do continue to do up rounds and progress this, then we're not gonna we're not gonna take any more financing. So I think we have a catalyst risk two years that is fully funded. We have a polymetallic deposit that is a rare opportunity within Canada. That you see our competitor, our limited competitors trading at valuations that are much, much higher than us on a per tonnage basis. So I think it's really this asset was is still very unknown because it was with a private entity for so long. So I think we have a lot of catalysts, but we also have to show the clear growth potential of the asset, start to get analyst coverage and hit some of the other markets to really get the story out and, and also hit the institutions that do want a critical exposure within their portfolio. Well, John, thanks so much for hopping on here today. I think you've got a very interesting story. Um, I appreciate uh, CEOs that stand behind their deals and back them when the times are tough. And I feel like you earn everything you get when the times are good and uh, things pick up. It feels like we're entering a really exciting time in the copper market. Uh, so great time to be announcing some pretty big copper drill holes. So congratulations on those holes. And please keep coming back on here as you guys continue to expand your discovery and turn Abitivi into a billion dollar company. Just remember us uh, little guys and still have time for us uh, after you accomplish that. Of course. Appreciate you uh, having me today, Steve. Thanks, John. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe and ring that notification bell. Also, let us know what you think in the comment section. Thanks, everyone.